Hi, everyone. My name is Brent Sr. and I'm at the University of North Carolina. And I'm going to be speaking a little bit about chronic rhinosinusitis, its background and diagnosis. In terms of disclosures, I am a consultant for Lyra and for Stryker. A common theme throughout history is that noses get sick. Um, I love this passage from uh, John Bell, who was a surgeon and an anatomist from Edinburgh, Scotland. And this comes from his textbook of surgery from 1810. And he says in describing nasal polyps that the tumor in no long period begins to project from the no nostril, grows wide and thick, and the nose is turned toward the opposite side. The root of the nose swells and becomes puffy. The features tumid and flabby, the face yellow, and the parts around the eye livid. The patient is affected with headaches, which seem to rend the bones asunder. And at this, at this stage, the patient realizes that he will die and becomes resigned to his fate. He's pale with a waxen face, saliva drools from his mouth, and foul matter drips from his nose. Eventually, he sinks into a perpetual stupor and dies in lethargy. A very, very dramatic description of what it was like to have nasal polyps uh, in the 1800s. And while it's a miserable disease to have, uh, it's also been traditionally a very miserable disease to treat. Certainly sinus surgery has not had a good reputation. And in fact, Hippocrates is credited with the very first early surgical description of polypectomy, where he would uh, affix a ligature to a sponge and and advance it through the nose from the nasopharynx forward, basically amputating anything that came with it. And medical history being what it is, uh, surgical procedures really didn't advance very much over the ensuing millennia. Uh, Joseph Haydn, a famous composer who's pictured here on this slide, had a, a very similar procedure performed on himself in 1783 for his lifelong problems with nasal polyps and sinusitis. And after undergoing that procedure, he suggested that his surgeon should putrefy under the earth. While it was certainly miserable, the procedures that were being done, they were also very dangerous. And Harris Mosher, of course, is quoted uh, as uh, uh, saying that any surgery in the ethmoid sinuses should be simple, but it has proven one of the easiest ways to kill a patient. And indeed, even in the 2020s, we still see patients attempting to be killed by sinus surgery, as this uh, uh, MRI shows of a patient who was having sinus surgery and, and had portions of the frontal lobe removed. Well, we know in a more scientific way that, that sinus disease is indeed miserable disease. Uh, this is an early article from the 1990s using the SF36, the short form 36 quality of life assessment form. And in this particular uh, article, 158 patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, of whom 80% underwent surgery, were analyzed. And looking at the short form 36 results, you see that patients with chronic rhinosinusitis had significantly worse general health, vitality, social functioning and bodily pain than the general population. And in fact, the bodily pain and the social functioning was worse than patients who had CHF, angina, COPD, and even chronic low back pain. Subsequent articles and research has looked at quality of life impact of patients with chronic renal sinusitis with nasal polyps. And, and similar findings have been found. For example, with significantly lower physical component and mental component scores compared to age-adjusted population norms using the short form 36. Females, the elderly, and highly educated are actually more likely to suffer with impaired quality of life when experiencing CRS compared to other patients. The good news though, is that this does appear to improve with surgical intervention. Other significant quality of life impacts of chronic rhinosinusitis include anxiety and depression. 
we know that about 25% of patients with CRS are treated for depression. And that compares to about 16% of the general population. We also know that there's significant olfactory dysfunction in chronic rhinosinusitis, with about 45% of patients experiencing hyposmia and 22% with anosmia. And in fact, olfactory dysfunction has been clearly shown to decrease overall quality of life. In addition, patients with CRS have been shown to have reduced sleep and sexual activity scores using uh, a disease-specific tool, the rhinosinusitis disability index. And once again, we see that this actually improves following surgical intervention with endoscopic sinus surgery. Further, fatigue and fibromyalgia are commonly associated with CRS. And once again, there is some evidence suggesting they may improve with sinus surgery. Well, most of this information that I'm telling you so far has been garnered from the short form 36 or general quality of life assessment tools. But there have been many very disease specific quality of life tools developed for chronic viral sinusitis. And this is table illustrates the, chronic, uh, the uh, uh, variety of forms that are available. Most commonly used currently are the SNOT 22 developed in 2003, which is a 22 item uh, uh, test, primarily focused on symptoms. And then the RSDI uh, developed in 1997, 30 questions. And this one is divided into three domains, a physical, a functional, and an emotional domain. So each of these domains can be separately scored. Now, in addition to these two tools, uh, the Chronic Sinusitis Survey was developed in 1995, the RSI in 2003, the RSOM 31 in 1995, and the Rhino QOL in 2005. Now, we know that chronic rhinosinusitis is a very common inflammatory syndrome of the paranasal sinuses, and it's been estimated to have a prevalence of about 12% or so in the United States. Similar numbers are seen in Europe, about 10.9% is the latest estimate, whereas lower numbers are seen in Canada, maybe about 4.5%. Now, it is important to point out, though, that these estimates are very controversial. Symptom-based surveys really are, are believed to overestimate uh, the true uh, uh, prevalence of this disease due to the overlap of symptoms with other diagnoses, such as primary headache disorder, allergic rhinitis, and other types of rhinitis. Clinically-based evaluations suggest maybe around 2% of patients with self-diagnosed CRS really are found to have CRS. Well, we also know that the socioeconomic cost of CRS is very high. And it's high as a result of its high prevalence in society, the chronic nature of the condition, frequently associated with acute ex exacerbations requiring intervention. Clearly, there's a high quality of life impact, as we've already shown. And also, frankly, a lack of cure all of these features leading to a significant socioeconomic cost for the disease. In addition, patients who suffer from CRS are indeed frequent utilizers of the healthcare system. In fact, CRS, CRS patients account for 43% more outpatient visits and 25% more urgent care visits than patients without CRS. In addition, CRS patients will fill more prescriptions, about 43% more prescriptions than patients without CRS. And clearly, this increased utilization is going to translate into increased direct costs to the system. And when we do think about economic burden and societal impact, we can think about it in those two domains, the direct costs of the disease, as well as the indirect costs. So direct costs being physician visits, the cost of the medical treatment, the cost of surgical treatment, the cost of medications. Indirect costs are more related to things like reduced work productivity, missed work days, absenteeism, 
or decrease productivity while at work, what's called presenteeism. CRS is indeed an expensive chronic condition, and it has a significant economic burden to society when you start factoring in these direct and indirect costs. Direct costs in the United States are estimated to be around 10 to $13 billion, whereas indirect costs in the US are estimated to be greater than $20 billion. And it does appear that these costs related to CRS are increasing faster than the rate of inflation. When we look at direct costs specifically in a review of the United States data, we see that uh, patients um, with CRS uh, uh, have expenditures of about $772 plus or minus $300 per patient. Um, 346 of this for office-based expenditures, 397 for prescriptions, and possibly around $90 for self expenditures. When we look at European data, again, the numbers are fairly high. Um, 2,427 pounds on primary and secondary care costs uh, uh, from a, a, a UK study and 253 pounds in out-of-pocket expenditure. So very, very costly. When we think about indirect costs associated with CRS, the estimates do vary by study and by region, but universally they demonstrate significant indirect costs. Patients in the US miss an estimated average of somewhere between 19 and 24 days a year as a result, a direct result of CRS. In addition, it's estimated there may be about 28.8 mean days lost re related to presenteeism. Patients in Europe, a little bit lower uh, numbers, about 10.6 workdays uh, directly lost as a result of um, a CRS, whereas uh, presenteeism about the same as what's been reported in the US, about 30.4 mean workdays lost related to presenteeism. And it's as a result of these numbers, it's estimated that uh, there's an indirect cost of over $10,000 per patient per, peer, per year in the United States. And in, the, in Europe, it's estimated at about 5,659 euros per patient per year. So once again, very, very expensive burden for society. Let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis. How do we diagnose this disease? Well, there've been many efforts made over the decades to try to, to get a handle on how we actually define this disease and diagnose it. A big effort was made back in the mid-1990s with what's called the Rhino Sinusitis Task Force that was established by the American Academy of Otolaryngology. And this effort um, came up with a symptom-based uh, diagnosis of this disease, where you had major criteria and minor criteria. And the diagnosis of, of CRS was made when you had two major criteria occurring in a particular individual combined with um, uh, one major and two minor as another alternative. So the major criteria that we looked at are nasal obstruction, hyposmia or anosmia, purulence in the nasal cavity, fever in children, and facial pain and pressure when used in, other, uh, in conjunction with other features. Some of the minor uh, criteria include headache, fever, halitosis, fatigue, dental pain, cough, and ear pain and pressure and fullness. So two major criteria that was di diagnosed, diagnostic of CRS are one major and two minor. But was this really right? Well, it became very clear quickly that in fact, this wasn't right. Um, and this was a nice uh, review done by Jim Stankwitz and Jim Chow in uh, 2002, 78 patients were prospectively evaluated, met these diagnostic criteria, these symptomatic criteria as defined by the, by the uh, um, previous uh, methods. And only about half of the patients had any evidence of mucosal thickening on CT that would suggest in fact that this was the diagnosis. 
So what is chronic rhinosinusitis? Well, well the, the old paradigm was that rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis was a mucosal infectious disease. It was really a plumbing problem. You had swelling in the sinus channels, leading to obstruction, mucostasis, bacterial infection, swelling, obstruction, mucostasis, and we got into the cycle. The new paradigm uh, that has developed over the last 20 years, however, is that rhinosinusitis is really a disease of inflammation. It's not simply mucosal infectious disease. It's inflammation, and it's inflammation from different sources, but still all inflammation. So we have uh, examples of, of uh, nasal polyps filling the nasal cavity here. We have examples of, of scattered mucosal thickening in the ethmoid sinuses. We have a allergic fungal sinusitis, and we have cystic fibrosis, all of these being diseases of inflammation and resulting in rhinosinusitis. And, and we know that the pathways of inflammation are going to vary uh, in different individuals, in different uh, phenotypes of disease. So we have different endotypes with different inflammatory pathways resulting in different disease processes. The predominant endotypes that are discussed currently are the Th1, the Th2, and the Th17. So we're going to start in the middle here first, the Th2 pathway. Th2 pathway uh, involves IL-25 and IL-33 uh, with the innate lymphocyte cell two uh, being stimulated. That leads to Th2 cell stimulation. There's uh, uh, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 cytokines that are released. And this compares to the Th1 pathway, where you have IL-18 interacting with the innate uh, uh, lymphocyte cell one. This leads to Th1 cell development uh, with uh, cytokines interfering with gamma as well as TNF-alpha uh, being released. And then you have the Th17 pathway seen over here, where we have uh, the innate lymphocyte cell 3, um, leading to the Th17 cell, matru uh, cell maturation, with IL-17, IL-22 being predominant cytokines here. So these different endotypes are now resulting in different phenotypes of the disease. And understanding these endotypes now has allowing us to start to start targeting very specifically some of these uh, uh, cytokines in these particular disease processes. Well, let's talk a little bit more about definition of the disease. And there's basically two uh, predominant definitions of chronic rhinosinusitis that are out there now. One has been proposed by the European Physician Paper on Rhinosinusitis and Nasal Polyps. That's the EPOS document. And the other is from the International Consensus on Allergy and Rhinology, the so-called ICARS document. Between these two documents, there are some slight variations in how acute and chronic rhinosinusitis are defined and uh, diagnosed and classified. So the EPOS diagnostic criteria involves symptoms of nasal blockage or nasal obstruction or nasal congestion or nasal discharge and either facial pain or pressure and or reduction of loss or loss of sense of smell and either endoscopy with nasal polyps and or mucoperiodon discharge primarily from the middle meatus and or edema or mucosal obstruction primarily in the middle meatus and or radiology which reflects mucosal changes within the OMC or, and or the sinuses. So the idea here is that we're defining the disease with symptoms and we're going to confirm it with either endoscopy and or radiology. EPOS further classifies the disease as acute rhinosinusitis when the symptoms uh, rhinosinusitis are present for less than 12 weeks, or chronic rhinosinusitis when the symptoms of inflammation are present for greater than 12 weeks. 
Now, in addition, EPOS has a classification of recurrent acute final sinusitis, which is greater than four episodes per year, greater than or equal to four episodes per year, with a symptom-free interval between each episode. EPOS further classifies uh, something called primary and secondary CRS. So this tries to incorporate some of these ideas about endotype that we were just referring to. With primary CRS, you have localized disease, anatomically localized disease versus diffuse disease. So for individuals with localized disease, for example, unilateral disease, you could have a type two endotype dominance and that would be an example, for example, of, of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Or you could have a non-type 2. This would be the type 1 TH17 type uh, 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 variations, endotypes. And this could be just simply isolated sinusitis, isolated maxillary sinus disease, isolated sphenoid disease as examples. For primary CRS with diffuse presentation, bilateral diffuse presentation, uh, patients, again, could have type 2 endotype dominance, and this would reflect uh, uh, examples such as CRS with nasal polyps, eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis, uh, diffuse allergic rhino, uh, fungal sinusi uh, rhinosinusitis, or central compartment atopic disease. In addition, you can have diffuse bilateral anatomic uh, distribution with non-type 2 endotype dominance, and this would be the non-eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis type scenario. Now, what about secondary CRS? Well, secondary CRS, again, similarly can be uh, viewed in terms of its anatomic description, uh, distribution with a localized disease versus diffuse disease. With localized disease uh, um, uh, being, uh, for example, odontogenic disease, fungus ball, tumors, Whereas diffuse disease is going to be uh, mechanically uh, defined uh, with PCD and CF, or it's going to be as a result of inflammation like GPA or eGPA, or as a result of immune deficiencies, such as a selective immune deficiency like CVID. Now, ICARS defines acute and chronic rhinosinusitis slightly different than EPOS. Acute has the same, essentially the same symptomatic diagnostic criteria as EPOS, but it does not require endoscopy or radiology. It is a symptom-based diagnosis. Note that in pediatric population that the symptoms of facial pressure are not included in the diagnosis, and it's also recognized that nasal discharge should be discolored in the pediatric population. So for definition of chronic renal sinusitis, we see patients should have symptoms, two or more of the following, nasal discharge, nasal obstruction or congestion, decreased sense of smell, hyposmia, facial pressure or pain, and in pediatric CRS, cough. In addition to the symptoms, should have endoscopy with one or more of the following findings, evidence of inflammation, and evidence of purulence coming from the paranasal sinuses or the OMC. And or they should have evidence of, of radiology evidence of disease with inflammation seen in the sinuses. Further, the ICARS uh, classifies the disease just slightly different. Whereas um, we see here that acute rhinosinusitis has uh, findings or symptoms uh, less than four weeks uh, defined by those diagnostic criteria that we just went over. Chronic renal sinusitis is greater than 12 weeks of the symptoms and the findings on endoscopy or radiology. And further, CRS by the ICARS classification is divided into CRS without nasal polyps and CRS with nasal polyps. And again, just simply based on the presence or absence of nasal polyps. Now, ICARS also introduces the idea of subacute rhinosinusitis. This is for patients that have uh, meet the diagnostic criteria, but they're in that, that middle zone of time between four weeks 
and 12 weeks uh, of symptoms. Further, ICARS does also uh, recognize recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, again, with four or more episodes of acute rhinosinusitis per year with very distinct symptom-free intervals between each episode. Uh, remembering that each of these episodes must meet the criteria for acute rhinosinusitis. And then also there's acute exacerbation of chronic rhinosinusitis, where you have a sudden worsening of symptoms of CRS with a return to baseline uh, following treatment. Schematically, this is what ICARS presents for its classification of sinusitis. So we have the adult with sinusitis symptoms. And then again, based on timing, you have less than four weeks of symptoms. That's acute rhinosinusitis. Between four and 12 weeks, subacute. And greater than 12 weeks with signs and symptoms of CRS. And we start going down this pathway where we look for evidence of nasal polyps. So we have it chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis or chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps. And of course, if no evidence sinonasal inflammation objective findings are noted on endoscopy or CD, CT scanning, then the patient does not have CRS. So in conclusion, chronic rhinosinusitis is chronic disease and it results from chronic inflammation involving a variety of pathways. It's highly prevalent airway disease leads to significant disability, high impact on the quality of life of the individual. It also has significant economic impact on the healthcare systems all around the world. And it's important to realize that the diagnostic criteria and classifications have been well established now with the ICARS document and the EPOS document with utilization of a variety of symptoms and signs and leading to slightly different classification systems of the disease. These are some of the sources uh, which we've used for uh, this presentation today. And I thank you very much for your attention.